What do you like about podcasting? Interviewing is by far like my favorite part. And that's definitely what I'm like best at is like actually having the conversations. Talking about podcasting, do you think podcasting helps build your brand and credibility? It's honestly a networking hack. So what's the difference in Tech Guide and the business cloud? And why did you decide to shut the business cloud? We had a $26,000 a month. What's your take on productized services for an agency? There's so many tools out there now to like chop stuff up. Hey guys. Welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Ryan Atkins. You used to work in an aquatic center. You've done a bunch of sales and digital marketer roles. You were a growth specialist at HubSpot. You were the podcast host on a podcast you started called The Business Cloud. You're currently doing a couple different things. You host a podcast called Tech Guide. You help host Upflip podcast. You're the CEO and co-founder of Spacebar Visuals, and you're also the founder of Magic Media. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. That uh, makes me sound so accomplished being here. <laughs> That's the goal. It's, it's, it's all optics. It's yeah. all about optics. It, it's all about optics for sure. <laughs> what do you like about podcasting? Why have you been involved with three different productions? Yeah, podcasting, I mean, as you know, so I started my going into my senior year of school, like early August, um, like that senior year, I was like, oh, man, I would connect with entrepreneurs. I want to connect with executives. I want to be an entrepreneur someday. Like, how can I like just start talking with these people? And I was like, let me do a podcast. Um, so that's kind of how the business cloud got started, um, was just connecting with executives, entrepreneurs, people that have like built these successful businesses. And like, I was at the University of Iowa, which like, we have a great alumni network, but like, not like startup very startup y yeah. like founders there. So it was just an opportunity to do that. And like from there it's been an incredible experience. There's a thousand reasons to love podcasting. But like one of them is just like the conversations you get to have. Like the conversation we're gonna have today is gonna be incredible. The conversations I've had have been incredible. And it's just like a it's honestly a networking hack. If you're young in your career, I would a thousand percent recommend podcasting because like the conversations you'll have, the things you'll learn, the people you'll meet, all all makes it worth it. Podcasting is generally like one of the best life hacks I've ever done. If you had to pick one moment, one conversation or one specific moment from a conversation mm. from the multiple productions you've had, what would you say has, you know, stuck with you throughout and what was it? Who was the guest? Yeah. Oh man. There's been like so many cool guests that I've interviewed. I've interviewed like the founder of eight sleep, the founder of level, someone that's been like to the Titanic and was like hired by like Jeff Bezos. Those are like some that stick out from like the business cloud. But recently with like the Upflip podcast, those conversations have been like I've learned so much from those just about like how these companies, these simple business plans are generating like millions upon millions of dollars for companies. Um, so I'd say from like the business cloud, uh, those three podcasts just stick out cause like they were just so cool. I'm like 22 years old. I'm interviewing like Alexander Zader the founder of eight sleep. And she's like, they're valued at like a billion dollars yeah. or something. And I'm just like sitting in like my home in like clear like Iowa and just like interviewing her. Um, so that one was like so cool. Uh, but yeah, the upflip recently has been like insanely good just to like learn about successful entrepreneurs and like the actual tactics they have put in place to grow to like a million plus a year in their companies. This is more a uh, personal question. Of course. With podcasting, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that mm -hmm. I think folks don't realize. I started this six months ago and it's a lot more work than you assume of like, hey, I'm talking with you, I just upload the video. Yeah. Yes, if you don't care about quality production, cutting out like all these ums and ahs. And I've listened to so many of my own conversations and people make a lot more pauses, jittery pauses that you end up cutting out and seeing mm -hmm. a final product. But the post-production and the pre-production is a lot of work, right? Yeah. I feel like I can spend a lot more time researching. I can do a lot better job of understanding who's in front of me. Yeah, yeah. But given the situation, I probably spend one or two hours at the most right now. I think I should be spending more. What part of this whole journey from guest booking to pre-production to having a conversation to post-production to also having to grow the podcast yeah. because you can only fund it for so long what do you like the most and what do you not like oh gosh interviewing is by far like my favorite part and that's definitely what i'm like best at is like actually having the conversations it's crazy because like my episodes like zero to like 80 to 100 you're kind of like oh 
like I would say zero to 50, you're like, oh, like I'm like, whatever. But like 50 to 100, you're like, oh, like I'm actually like starting to get better at this. And then really from like 100 to like 150, you're like, oh, like I'm actually like being able to direct this conversations. I know like what to pull, what to not pull. And like now I'm at like 225 episodes recorded and just like you'll experience across as well. Across all three or? Across all okay. three, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you're already experienced this, but like the growth that I've seen for myself of just like actively listening, being able to hold conversations, um, having like very deep conversations has from zero to 225 has been like exponential. It's been so cool. But the actual interviewing is by far like the best part of podcasting why I get into it. Um, that's by far the best. All the editing, all that stuff, I can do it. Like I have experience doing it. The content creation, like I can do that all. But like that I would much rather like hire out. I know people are better at it than I am, but the actual interviewing is like what I love to do. That's like, yeah, it's, it's what makes podcasting podcasting. And a lot of folks have said, oh, let's do virtual. Mm -hmm. And like I reached out to folks in SF, New York, Canada. Yeah, yeah. But I like the in person so much better oh, than yeah. I like the face in a box. Mm -hmm. At some point, I'm going to have to do the virtual. Yeah. But I'm trying to now get to a point where I'll go to New York for a week. Mm -hmm. Let me like pre plan the week, do yep. five, six, seven, SF, Canada, whatever, right? I think it's possible to do It's a lot more work. For sure. It costs a lot more to do them in studio. But I think, like you said, interviewing over here is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. You're more in the zone, less yeah. distractions. I can't guarantee someone's camera or audio quality when they're on the other side. Yep. And I'm fine with camera being shitty. <laughs> but if the audio feed is scratchy yeah. or not like crisp, I can't. I personally don't want to listen to a podcast. For sure. And so I again if i'm producing something but um i'm still only 40 40 episodes in yeah so i think there's a lot that i'm going to learn along the way but yeah i think i mean in person i do all of mine like remotely essentially um that like i've only done like a few in person and in person interviews are just so much better like you can get like so much deeper like you don't have like slack pulled up on your computer yeah, yeah. you're not getting that annoying like notification or anything yeah, yeah, yeah. um but yeah the in person way better and i think it is more expensive. Like it is way more time. It's way more effort. But like at the end of the day, I think your podcast is going to be 10 X better because of it actually doing in-person shoots and people like, I feel like when, when they're on YouTube and they're like watching, they want to see in-person shoots. It just looks way better. Um, Scott Miller on the walks actually gave me advice one time. He's like, if you want to appear like bigger than you are, like, you need to pay your, a bigger than like you are. He's like, when I was did podcasting like a year and a half ago, two years ago, something like that. Like my background was awful. There was nothing behind me. It was like placed on like uh, like the table. So I'm like looking yeah. down at them. I didn't have like a nice microphone. And he's like, if you want to peer bigger, like you need to like put those systems in place and like those things in place to actually peer bigger. And then your audience will definitely notice that as well. Do you know who Kevin Shen is? I do not, but yeah. If you, um, I'll send you a link after. He, peak of COVID, he became big on Twitter. He basically branded himself as the camera video background guy. Okay. So he built a whole course and system and cohort no of how to build good backgrounds. And he has a whole system of how do you design your background, the lighting, the color scheme. Yep. Hey, and then um, he'll take a video of like Justin Walsh's course yeah. and go on Twitter and be like, hey, here's how he should make it better. Because Justin Walsh uh, doesn't have like a good setup. Yeah. And so um, if you watch My First Million, mm -hmm. um, he did their background. And oh, so his insane. whole thing, his whole shtick is just, how do you make a good background? Interesting. How do you position yourself to have an authority? Mm -hmm. Should the camera be level, slightly upward, slightly? Like there's reasoning there's he has so behind everything. And he's like, if you're doing a course, here's what I would recommend. You don't want, you never want to look down on nope. the audience. And then there's different ways to like set up your style, background. Yeah. And he's just built a full business out of it. it he has a five, six hundred dollar course, or he has a fourth five thousand dollar done for you. What are they? Oh, about? that's and, insane. That and so I'll send you that. It's, I mean, he has a lot of free content as well. You don't have to like, yeah, um, do the course. But I think um, the camera stuff that you said, like looking down, like. Um, I recently read Christopher Nolan. He has a really good book out there. Um, uh, the Founders Guide, David, um, I'm blinking on his last name, but David from Found the Founders Podcast did it on uh, like a book recommendation on Christopher Nolan. And then I did, I read a George Lucas one. It's insane. Like the camera angles they get, and, like the whole thing that goes, we're, we're doing, talking about podcasting, but yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, goes yeah. into like a movie as well of like how to get like sh different shots and like sequences together. And like when I, when I was reading, I was remember I was like, oh, like podcasting is like kind of like this, like you're kind of directing it. But yeah, those are two like phenomenal books to 100%. go on a little side tangent there. <laughs> talking about podcasting, do you think podcasting helps build your brand credibility? And I think you briefly touched upon this, but if you had to start something today, mm -hmm. if you're, let's say a founder spinning something off, yeah, 
How do you think about podcasting and what do you think someone should do to build up that brand and credibility? It's a great question. Um, so I know podcasting is being used in like a few different ways. Um, one is like that thought leadership component of just like, oh, like I'm an authoritative figure. I can talk about this topic. And I think that's another great way. I know companies are using it for like lead gen where like they'll invite like their ideal customer profile on and like interview them and like basically make the introduction. Um, and then at the end, they be like, oh, like, by the way, we also sell X, Y, Z. Like, would you want to do it? And like, I know some companies are doing it there. But I think if you're an executive, if you're any, just honestly anyone, Podcasting is such a great way because you get this one piece of content. This will be an hour long or whatnot, but you can chop it up into like a blog, yeah. an email, um, into social posts, into on YouTube, of course. So like this one piece of content can be used in five or six different ways. And it is such an easy like content machine for some for an executive to get their words out there to make them more well known. So there are so many like benefits to podcasting. It's so easy to there's so many tools out there now to like chop stuff up. Um, so yeah, just any executive I think should be doing like some sort of podcasting to connect with investors, to connect with other executives, people in their ICP. Um, yeah, cause you can use it in so many different ways. So yeah, anyone that is thinking about doing a podcast that's an executive should do it cause the benefits are very unreal. <laughs> so you're doing two different podcasts, Tech Guide, Upflip, you have your company Spacebar Visuals and Magic Media. Why start four things around the same time? Yeah. Uh, I business ADHD. <laughs> um, honestly, like I've always been someone that has had like my hand in like multiple different things here. Um, so like space art visuals is definitely like the baby of the babies. Like that's what I care about the most. That's what I work on the most that what I can't fall asleep at night. That's what I'm thinking about, um, is space bar visuals. But I don't know, like I've always just been interested in like doing so many different things. I like having my hands in different areas. I could get bored easily. So it kind of keeps my brain like always working on like different podcasts, different conversations I'm having there, but also just like actually being like a CEO and like being able to like drive revenue for a company, all that stuff, like hire, like what a CEO like does for a company. So yeah, I don't know. I, I work on like four different things essentially, um, but it's fun. It keeps me, keeps me young, keeps me out of the streets. <laughs> so what's the difference in tech guide and the business cloud and why did you decide to shut the business cloud or like stop yeah, yeah. those episodes versus move on to a different kind of brand story? Yeah, phenomenal question. So the business cloud I ran for, oh God, I want to say I got to like 82 episodes. I ran that from maybe two and a half years, something like that. Um, I can't remember, but essentially a uh, tech guide reached out to me and they're like, hey, like we want to start a podcast, um, like interviewing people like to break into tech and to uh, like career advice and all that stuff. And they were like, we'll pay you for it. And I was like, like, okay, like, why not? <laughs> so that was like my actually first like contracting gig um, to be a podcast host. So they just basically reached out to me. And I was like, I only want to focus on like one thing and do one thing like very, very well. I know I'm doing like four things now, but uh, yeah, it's just kind of the pivot. I was just like, uh, I mean, we'll make sure this doesn't pop up on their feet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, basically they reached out and they wanted me to be a podcast host. And I was like, if you want to pay me to be a podcast host, like, sure, I'll do it. So that's kind of how I pivoted from like the business cloud to uh, tech guide. Nice. And same with Upflip, they just reached out and... Yep, Upflip as well. Um, they just found me through Upwork and I'm very passionate about people like putting profiles on Upwork and just even just having something stagnant there because someone might reach out to you. But yeah, Upflip reached out to me uh, through Upwork to become their podcast host. So I've been with Upflip now for three months-ish, four months-ish. Um, and yeah, those conversations have been the same. They're amazing clients to work for. I'm so happy and I'm so passionate about like what they're doing. It kind of reminds me of, like the business cloud in a way, honestly. So I feel like I'm kind of getting back to my roots with Upflip and yeah, nice. they've been amazing. And for both of these, you're just hosting. Are you involved with pre post production, mm -hmm. finding guests or not? Or are you just having the interviews, doing the conversations? Um, tech guide, I do, I do everything. So I do the guest outreach, the pre production, um, like the research, the interviews, the content creation, the publishing, all that good stuff. For Upflip, um, I'm actually just hosting that one. So okay. a little bit lighter of a load, but I'm still doing like a ton of research before yeah. um, and then just hosting that one. So yeah, nice. it's been, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Pretty cool. So. You mentioned a post recently about Spacebar Visuals and how your team is one of the reasons that drives you, motivates you. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on team building? How do you hire the right folks? Oh, and how do you <laughs> think about team building? as a, Like, how important is it? How do you think about team building yeah. in general? Hiring has been one of, like, the hardest parts about Spacebar Visuals and, like, one of the most unexpected challenges. You just, like 
there are so many great candidates out there. So I'm like, we'll post a job and like, you'll get like 50 applications or so. And like, some are like pretty easy. Like, uh, like they're not a fit. Like we're going to take them away. And like some, you get like a majority are like, oh, like these are pretty good. And then you'll have some there. It's like, okay, these are really good. But there's like still 10 of them. Being able to distill like who is really good, um, who's actually going to succeed in the role, who's actually like, a culture fit is like, it's a very hard thing to do really. And like we interviewed for like a BDR role, we interviewed like 10 different people for it. And it's like, you guys are all like, kind of the same here like what are the ways that we can actually see who's going to work um we hired someone and he's been phenomenal for us his name's matt he's actually like doing account management for us now but yeah hiring is like so hard and you're just like i don't know it's just what are your core values as a company we 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 hired before we did our core values and if i could do, redo it i would put our core values into actual place and then hire based off our core values um because i believe moving forward that'll make it easier for us to actually hire so um, that's kind of what we did for hiring, um, team building. We are all remote. Um, so my co-founder is in New York. We have someone in Milwaukee. We have two people in Beaumont, Texas area. Um, and so when we get together, we are a remote first company. So I wish I could talk more about like team building and actually being like, oh, like we get together every weekend for like happy hour and like work together. But those in-person times that we are together are like so special just because like it's so much fun to be in person. And, like the conversation, it's like a podcast, honestly, yeah. like the conversations are just like way more engaging you can get way more stuff done in person but um yeah i don't know just we try to build like a winning culture and like celebrate those wins like what are those goals you guys want to have this week to get away um what are those wins you want to have this week so yeah it's it's a challenge remotely but um yeah you kind of find ways around it so uh why don't you quickly tell the listeners what is space bar visuals what is magic media mm -hmm. and then have some follow-up yeah yeah well we'll start with magic media um magic media so we do it's basically like what i do with tech guide so we do the pre-production uh, we can do the interviewing we can do the post-production we can do the editing publishing all that stuff so that's magic media um what i'm like truly 100 percent like focus on is uh, space bar visuals so space bar visuals we create animated videos for SaaS companies we typically will do like product demos explainer videos uh, customer testimonials, we'll repurpose like white papers, event video. So we were like your all in one animated video suite. So yeah, that's what, uh, that's been like my main focus. That's, that is the baby of everything. So talking about space bar visuals, when did you decide to start it? And what, what gap did you see? What was the inkling? Why did you say, Oh, I want to go do this for this industry? Yeah. Great question. So how we actually got started, as I said, I've always wanted to be like an entrepreneur. I was raised by like entrepreneurs. Like I just always wanted to be it. Um, so I was on Twitter one day in November of 22, that would have been, um, just on Twitter, just scrolling mindlessly. And I came across a tweet from a guy named Brandon. I didn't even follow him. I saw someone quoted it and it was like, just sold my last company for like six figures. Like I want to start another company, like reach out to me if you want to be like a co-founder and operator with me. And I was like, shit, like I'll just, I'll just shoot my shot here. So I sent him an email with like a little loom video. It's like, Hey, I'm Ryan. Like I was at HubSpot. I was at Lumion, like digital marketing type of thing. Um, pitched myself to him and God behold, we hit it off. We uh, met up, um, remotely and that's basically how we met. And so we came up with three ideas. We're like, we're interested in media, we're interested in selling to software companies and we're interested with like B2B. That's like who we wanna to sell to because um, we had experience with that. So we were like, let's do a ghostwriting agency on like LinkedIn or something, a newsletter growth agency or like a video marketing agency. And we were like, kind of took away the newsletter growth agency. I was like, I don't know how that's gonna work, but like video, we were both interested in like the trends were there. So we, um, we were basically like, let's do a video marketing agency. Um, so that started about a year and a half ago. We had our first sale of March of 2023. So a year and two months ago now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the birthplace of Space Bar Visuals. We met on Twitter, wanted to do media, B2B, and hit it off with uh, animation videos. Was it just you two guys when you started out? Yep, just us two when we started out. Um, it's crazy to like, think about like those very early days of it because it's like, like you're doing like the website coffee, you're like setting up like all the emails and now yeah. like we hire people to do that type of stuff. But yeah, it was it was just us too. How big start. was the first check? The You know what's crazy? So our, we had two sales in March and they're like back to back days. We closed a deal for like $7,500 and then the next day we closed another deal for $7,500. So right off of the bat, March, 2023, we closed like 15,000 sales. We're like, oh my gosh, like did we just, just like strike gold with this? But then April, May and June came along and we didn't sell anything. <laughs> so it was like that a little bit of like beginner luck, but because we had about $10,000 in like a seed investment um, and then we had that $15,000, we luckily were able to stay alive. But yeah, it was a 
pretty funny to uh, get 15K that first month of selling and then nothing for like three months. Quick step back on your journey. Yeah. When did you guys decide to start this? And how long was that until the first check came in? Yeah. So we started, we met November, 2022. Um, basically, we got started January, 2023 when we were like, okay, let's start pulling lists. Let's start doing outbound on stuff. Let's like get a website set up. And I'm just like working this on the side essentially. So I'm putting like 10, 15, 20 hours a weekend on it. Nothing like crazy. Um, so it was about three months, I would say January, 2023, we launched and it was about three months, um, or two months, whatever until March until we got our first check. What was the point where you guys are like, okay, we're going to do this full time effectively. Yeah. So Brandon, he's incredible. He's basically like a business mentor to me. He's my co-founder. He's about five years older. He works on like five or six different businesses. He has like a hold co. So he does a bunch of different stuff. Okay. Honestly, five and six might be an understatement too. Um, I worked on it from March, 2023 to November, 2023, um, just on the side. And then about, I want to, that was my time frame. about August, 2023 though, I sat down, I was like, what is it actually going to take for me to like quit my job? And it was like three very, it was like three or four variables. Like I need to have a certain amount of money in my personal savings for one. Um, two, we need to have like certain revenue numbers. Three, like I need to buy like a MacBook. And so I basically put that process in place and then hit all three to the certain threshold we wanted to be at. And I was like, time to quit my job. So um, yeah, it was March, uh, March, 2023 to November, 2023, I'd say. Yeah. Okay, nice. Um, in terms of building an agency, mm -hmm. why did you guys decide to go the agency route? Cause there's pros and cons of running an agency for sure. Yeah. Um, why agency versus SaaS tech, anything there, like there's so many options even within the space, right? Mm -hmm. Why go the agency route? Yeah. I think anyone that's like, um, anyone listening, like you have to like know what like your unique skills are and like kind of where you're at in life. Like I've never built a business by myself. So, um, it was an agency you can cash flow like right away essentially. Yeah. So we wanted something that could cash flow like pretty early on. I don't have any experience like before that, of course, like building a company, I don't yeah. know what it takes. And I feel like all businesses are hard. Do not get me wrong. It is the hardest thing I've ever done, but agencies compared to like a SaaS product is relatively easier from a cash flow perspective. I'm 100%. sure there are challenges, yeah. pros and cons to both, but it was just kind of natural because he has an agency background. He sold an agency. I knew like I could sell like a services like that instead of just like complete SaaS product, which the initial investment instead of like a 10 K seed investment might've been like 50 K. And it's like, we don't even know we're going to net positive here. So, um, that was kind of our thinking about how we approach it, how I approached it as well. Getting into an agency, do you ever worry about um, monthly recurring revenue, ARR, oh, MRR? Yeah. Because not every agency has a recurring model. I don't mm -hmm. know if you go. I don't we know do what, not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so when you don't have a recurring model, like you said, made 15 grand in March, but April, May, June. Exactly. Nothing came in. So how do you think about that from an agency perspective? Mm -hmm. How do you guys handle inbound, outbound, churn? Yeah. And I don't want to use like SaaS terminology, but I at the core of it, like you have to have a certain number of customers sign every month because yep. you have a certain LTV, whatever, <laughs> yep. right? And so how do you think about that in general and why pick this model versus a recurring model versus a productized service model? How Just how do you think about that? How did you approach it and why go the way you've gone so far? Yeah, that's a great question. And that is one thing that's like a con of agency work of like the agency work that we do is like truly every month when it hits July 1st, you start at zero again. and that is the major con of agency work compared to like a SaaS model where like it scales very nicely. You can get high margins. You can get that monthly recurring revenue. Um, you know, like looking back on, I wish our pricing model was a little bit more like SaaS focused, but just because of like what we're in, like it can't be. Yeah. So every month it's basically like a bunch of outbound. Like we try to send like 15, 20,000 emails a month. Like we are like working the phones. We, we're hiring people to like make calls, make cold calls, send those cold emails. Um, so it really, it truly is like a grind and you can have a great month, like, like a 15 K month and the next month, the next three months you can go to zero. So that is a con of agency work, I will say. And like the business model that does exist and like what we currently do, there are ways you could probably get around it with like, like setting up some sort of recurring, like w whatever for like videos. But yeah, that I would say that is like the con of agency work, but it makes it fun. Since going full-time, what's been your best month in terms of 
uh, revenue? Best month in terms of revenue. Um, we had a $26,000 month. So that's been like our best month. Nice. Um, 26. Yeah. Somewhere around there. But cool. yeah, we're trying to, we're consistently hitting like 15, 20 K a month. Um, the reason I ask is I think from my understanding of your service, it's a very one-time use service. It's mm -hmm. like, we're going to do this and then we may not need an update to our product video network yeah, yeah. for a while, right? Like people aren't really changing their product every month or every two months. Yeah. And are you ever worried about that? That, um, because I, I, I run a software agency. I know yeah, a lot yeah. of folks uh, in the agency space. And some things that eight or nine figure agency owners talk about is your best way to grow is to have a certain clientele and sell them more services. Mm. Um, and that's the fastest way to go from six figure agency to seven figure agency, yeah, right? And then once you do that, now you start figuring out, okay, how do I keep these people longer? Yeah. Cause a good agency has customers for two, three years and not just one, two months at a time. Mm -hmm. Do you ever worry about that? Think about that in terms of growth and how you're going to grow and add services and products or yeah. are you solid on, Hey, we're just going to do this and do it really well and then just go do it for a lot of people. Yeah. It's a great question. And, um, it's funny that you say that when I was working at HubSpot, we had like an all hands meeting and Yamini, uh, who's the CEO yeah. there. She's like, how do we go from like, a 10 bill, whatever they're at, like $10 billion in revenue. It's like a hundred billion dollars in revenue. Um, and they said it was like all through like their existing customer base of like yeah. upselling them, like selling more. So you, d you hit the, you hit the nail on the, co the, the head right there. Um, but yeah, we want to, we, at our core, like we want to be like the best video animation studio out there. Like we want, if they come to our website, you know, like you're going to get a high quality product. And I say this all the time. Sometimes customers will ask us, Oh, can you do like X, Y, Z? And it's like, no, we can't do that. But like, if you want animated video, like we'll hit this out of the park for you. And I'm say that with hundred percent confidence. Um, I've now gotten to the point where I'll directly just say that to people like, no, we can't do that, but we can do animated video. We will like, we definitely want to expand our like offering, like doing like in-person shoots. I think that'll be just the next progression of like how we can actually grow. Like our revenue is offering like in-person shoots. We just, I, did not come into space our visual with like a whole lot of video knowledge. Um, I've had to learn basically all of it as we've gone and like I've learned so much, but the next like natural progression will be like doing in-person shoots and more like product offerings and just finding ways to like really expand like what we can really do. But like right now we are animated video like through and through. Um, that's what we can very much do for clients. Nice. What's your take on productized services um, for an agency? I have opinions, that's why I ask, but. Um yeah. Do you like them? Do you not like them? And do you think it applies to your use case? I haven't really thought about that too often just cause like we're all like service based, um, of like what we're doing. So I honestly like haven't really thought about that. So I don't know if I can give like a great yeah. answer to you, honestly. <laughs> um, the reason I ask is there's been a big push in the agency space to like prioritize your offering, make it super easy for people to decide and pick. On the contrary, I've met a couple local Austin folks who don't like productized services because what it does is it brings in unqualified clients mm -hmm. that become more of a pain in the ass than a good customer, right? Yeah. Because with productized offerings, you have a fixed onboarding flow. You're not really deciding whether to take them on or not. Yeah. And someone comes in, but just disregards the service altogether, but now you gotta still service them, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's why I, I just love getting people's takes because there's a big push to do it. Interesting. But there's, I think there's also a wrong way to do it. And it just hurts you more than it helps you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if I have a two star. No, that's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think about uh, client acquisition from an inbound perspective, outbound perspective, yeah. brand building perspective? Are you guys trying to build an agency where folks come to you because mm. they see your work? Or do you, are you using a mix of different channels? Like, yeah, I, I wish we were at that point right now where we were having a bunch of clients come to us. Uh, so we actually have a ton of growth to happen on our inbound processes. We just have not like really invested into like that organic, like our organic SEO, like that type of stuff as we should be. I was actually speaking with my co-founder Brandon today about this, so, like what we want to be doing in Q3. And that was like one of our biggest high pr highest priority actions. But right now how we're getting all of our clients is we do some newsletter advertising and that like, Last year it was way better. Like we were gonna like a three to four X ROI on newsletter advertising. This year it's been like 
less than one X, so it hasn't been great. Um, less than one X. Yeah, it's been it's oh, it's been. You bad, haven't yeah. even made your money. Yeah, we have not made our money back. <laughs> um, so newsletter advertising in twenty twenty four has been like, eh. How we're doing, how we're getting like all of our clients has been through straight outbound. So like I said, we're sending 15, 20 K emails a month. And what we do, our exact strategy on like how we grew to like six figures was we'll get a list from Upwork of like 500 contacts for like 50 bucks or something. They'll have the first name, last name, email address, job title, company name, et cetera, phone number. We'll then plug that list into uh, Instantly, which is our email outbound campaign. Um, we'll send them automated emails. That same list, we'll cold call them and then that same list will message them on LinkedIn. So we're hitting the phone with three different ways. And that has been a thousand percent like our most effective way for growth and like actually booking meetings. Let's talk through that a little more. So which channel within this do you see the most conversion in? So mm. are you getting email conversions for cold call conversions or LinkedIn conversions? And how do you think about that pipeline? What yeah. What's the first touch point? When do I do the second? When do I do the third? Um, how do yeah, you know? from a straight conversions uh, standpoint of like open deals to like actually closing deals, I would say, I want to say our, e our email marketing has been by far like the best and like cold calls up there as well. LinkedIn has been like iffy, but like if we're going to, if you're wanting to start an agency and you're wanting to grow like exponentially fast to like that 20, that 20 K a month, invest in cold email and invest in a, doing a lot of emails a month, like two X three X of what you actually think, like 20,000 emails a month is a lot of emails. <laughs> that is a lot of emails. So you need to make sure those systems are in place. And so email marketing has by far been our, like our best conversion rate, um, and standpoint of like opening deals, like actually closing a deal. So just thinking of like our past ones, events were pretty good for us as well though. But yeah, email marketing has definitely been our best one. Can you talk through what your email sequence is? What's your offer on email? Of course, and yeah. And how many, how long is that sequence? Of course, yeah. So I would say email is like actually kind of what I know best in a way. Um, just at HubSpot, they give us so many templates and stuff to use. So I use something called the 4T template. Um, the first T is truth. So it's like, saw you're the marketing director at XYZ. The next one is think. Um, so it's like, like other marketing directors, I'm sure or it's like, First one's truth, the second one's think. So you're asking them like a question to make them think, like how are you investing in video in 2024, something like that. The third one is third party evaluation. Val evaluation, so it's like we're working with AWS, ISO, the US Army to create videos to do 36%, some sort of benefit. Then the four, fourth T is talk, so like interested in learning more. Um, so truth, think, third party, and then talk. That's how we like set up all of our emails. The CTAs we've been playing with a little bit more. One that's been doing really well that did that did well this week on LinkedIn specifically was like, could I send you like three ideas we have for you for video? And then we'll send them like a quick loom. So that's been really good for us. Um, and then I always like the, are you interested type of CTA. So those are like the two that we've been really leaning on that have worked pretty well. Okay. And in terms of um, CTA, where does the CTA lead? Does it lead to a uh, pricing page, a calendar, uh, what calendar. does it lead to? Yeah, a calendar. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, our goal is to like book a meeting with them and like jump on there to like sell. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, if we are asking for time, it's always leading to a calendar. We never, we'll, we'll, we won't price, we won't link to like a pricing page. So calendars. On your sales calls, are you pretty fixed with pricing and what your offer is? Or are you malleable to like, Let's say you're offering seven and a half K, but this person like we have like five K budget or whatever. Yeah. How do you think about converging and closing those? That's a great question. I love the word malleable. That was a great word choice there. Um, but we're pretty fixed on like what we offer. So we're actually bumping our pricing up at July 1st, like 33% across the board. So we'll be at like a nine K package for three videos, like 12 K package for five videos and like 20 K for 10 videos types of things. It depends what the fit is. Like if they're like, we want three videos, but like we can only do like 6K, it's like, well, are you guys like gonna be like a good client or like what's kind of what's gonna work here? So yeah. we're definitely open. Like we wanna we wanna be a successful partner. Like we don't wanna like seem like a bully. Like we wanna have successful partnerships with people and like have those good relationships with like all their clients. Like I'm very passionate about like providing an excellent like customer experience for them. So if that's something I love working with startups, a lot of startups will have like budgeting, like we're always flexible to be in like the payment terms, everything like that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're malleable, I'd say up to a certain point. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to be like a pain in the ass, like probably not. <laughs> in your packages, yeah. are your margins all the same across the board or yeah. how do you, because Again, context for why I'm asking, um, on a different call I was a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. they were talking about, we 
like these are eight nine figure agency owners who yeah. are like we will take on a 2k a month deal because we know that there's potential to convert this to a couple hundred K over the year. It's a great way to think about but, it. But um but we're open to doing a small project because yeah. everyone's like scared of committing to a fifty yeah, yeah. deal, right? Yeah, it's fair. But what he what he said that I think I probably don't do very well is even though we're taking a two K deal, our margins stay the same. Mm. I'm never giving you four K of work for two K. I'll do the two K, but I'm not gonna do like these one and a half services. Because he's like, at the core of it, I'm still maintaining my margin on a per service basis. Interesting. And so that's why I asked when you said 9, 12, 20, are your margins on a per video basis the same? Or are you sort of giving up a little bit to get a bit? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That. So we are giving up. So if you do like our 20K deal, our margins are actually like less uh, than like what are, are less than like our smaller package. So yeah. our smaller package is actually like our best deal in terms for us, but like some companies just make sense to do yeah. like a 20 K package because they need like 10 videos and they have yeah. a plan for 10 videos and then they have the budget. So, um, it, it will only vary for about like 10% at most. Okay. Um, so yeah, we do give up margins, but they are still, they're also like, healthy. I mean, <laughs> I, I feel like there's a good healthy balance there, but for sure. Once he said that, I've just been thinking about everything. Okay. How do I price these services? How do I? Yeah. Offer? But no. Um, and that's like the cool thing about being an entrepreneur. I'm sure like when you're like working like a product management role or like a digital marketing specialist, you're not thinking about like your margins yeah, and everything. Yeah. It's, it is such like a fun way to think. It's such like a different way to think. And I mean, you went just, just went through that exercise as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's so much fun. <laughs> I also think um, like just being an entrepreneur, you can start. It's funny. I was having at the time of this recording, I met someone last night and we were talking about using the right words and frameworks for just everyday things. So I was like, I spend time doing X. And his advice was don't use the word spend, use the word invest. Ah. So where should I invest my time? Because I love that. Um, it just changes your outlook, right? Mm -hmm. Expanding on your thought. When you think about businesses, input, outputs, margins, mm. now you'll start thinking about everything from that perspective of like, okay, how much time should I spend doing X? What am I getting out of it? Well, yeah. And it's a good way to just frame stuff because when you're investing time, you're going to be more cautious with how you invest it mm -hmm. versus spending is a more frivolous. Yeah. Activity. Yeah. So just like, it's just, you're doing the same thing. You're mm -hmm. just like starting to think about stuff differently, but, um, I like that perspective. Too. Yeah, I honestly think life is full of like just how kind of like how you frame it in your head, uh, just exactly like that. Instead of spending money on this, I'm actually investing in myself. Yeah. I feel like I don't have a usage case off the top of my head, but I feel like there are so many different w scenarios that could be applied to as well. <laughs> um, I have a lot of hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I keep telling myself that all the money I spend on my hobbies is like my tuition. Yeah. Towards learning and growing on that hobby yeah maybe i don't get anything out of it but i justify the cost as like i would have paid 200 grand for college yeah i'm paying you know i have i do a lot of leather work i'm like spend a I bunch of it. money on leather working but but like stuff like that like cool hobbies like that is like you can bring that anywhere and like sometimes you might get on a call with a prospect and they're like and you're like oh what are you doing this week and they're like oh, i'm doing leather work this week it's like i'm doing leather work and like that all, all of a sudden you have like um that rapport built with them so like Honestly, in investing in hobbies, not spending time on hobbies, yeah. investing in hobbies is like one of the best things you can do because you can build rapport so easily with people through that way. What's what's your hobby? What's your current go-to activity outside of podcasting and work? The hobby that, I mean, reading is my probably my, my favorite hobby. I mean, working out, like working out, of course, but like reading by far is like my favorite hobby that I do. Um, what I mean, kind of books? Right now I'm reading a, a biography on John Rockefeller. Okay. Phenomenal book. I'm, I just crossed the 200 page mark, but it's been like so good. That guy was accomplished at age like 18. It's insane. At like 25, he's opening like Standard Oil and stuff and like building this billion dollar company at like such a young age. It's just like mind blowing to like read. So I love reading biographies. Those are by far my favorite to read. Are you a read and underline or audiobook or what kind of Kindle? Like, well, what's yeah, your I'm a read and underline, and I'll also tab stuff that I think that are really interesting, like write my thoughts in the margins. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I like that, underline. but my only thing is it slows you down quite a bit for compared sure compared to like Kindle and stuff. Yep, yep, yep. I stopped audiobooks just because so easy to phase out. I'm oh, like, yeah, 
like I have to keep going 30 seconds back. I'm like, what did he say? What did he yeah, say? Because say? Like, my, my, my <laughs> thought is like wherever, right? So, um, it, uh, An audio book, excuse me, that is phenomenal. I would recommend it's Matthew McConaughey's because he actually narrates it. Green light, yeah. insanely good. Um, Barack Obama also has a really good one because he okay. narrates okay. it. Um, so those are really good. But yeah, I'm a- I first them or it's AI. Do you know? Yeah, 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 who knows? No. <laughs> <laughs> who actually knows now? But um, yeah, I'm a I read and underline. So yeah, biographies, that's like- Biographies to me are such like a good way to just learn from, mm -hmm. it's like podcasts now. So you're just like reading about them. like Steve Jobs is one of my favorite ones. Uh, Elon Musk's is great as well from Walter Isaacson. Uh, Leonardo uh, da Vinci's, oh my God, phenomenal, like incredible biography. Aren't these so, super dense though? Like, Yeah, these uh, are dense books. These yeah, are basically yeah. textbooks, but so, like, <laughs> they're the fun to is, read. <laughs> so I, I don't read any fiction. I'm yeah. all like nonfiction. I'm all nonfiction fiction, as well. But, yeah. But my only thing is some of these books are so dense mm -hmm. that I don't, I don't want to just fly through them. Yeah. Um, but I then I read them slowly. But then now I'm at the point where I just pick up the book that I'm feeling at the moment. Like I'll oh, read a couple that. chapters, and okay, now I got to. I want to go read something else. I'll just put it back on the shelf. Interesting. Yeah. And then I'll pick it up, reread some stuff, and then read a couple more chapters because I feel like if I force myself to, like I'm, I was reading Venture Deals. Okay. Venture Deals, very dense book. Yeah. About VC stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I don't need to do anything with it. I'll just read some. Great. I'll go back, read some more. Yeah, yeah. If I'm like, I've got to finish this, it's so much stuff about that one thing that I feel like I don't retain as much. Versus that is fair. do bits and pieces because it's all like growth shit, right? Like, I mean, yeah. all of these books are like, learn something. And yeah, unless yeah. I'm doing from learning, what's the point of reading? But No, I thousand percent agree. Yeah, I'm, uh, I put it like... I, cause my thing with like books, like when they start to drag on, I try to finish a book like this is like a 700 page book. I'm going to try and finish th this puppy in like four weeks. So like I have like how many pages I need to like read a day. And it's like kind of like a fun, like challenge for me yeah. to like try and get through. Cause like, this is like a very, it's very dense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like, I do like that strategy. How often as well. do you reread books? You know what? I don't reread books that often. I've only, I think I've reread like three books in my life. Uh, Steve jobs by Walter Isaacson, shoe dog. Um, and then I reread another one recently. I can't think of it, but I might reread the Leonardo uh, da Vinci book because that book is insanely good. It, it, it's it's mind blowing good. <laughs> the reason I say that is, and I haven't done this yeah. yet, but someone recommended, er, like, there's some books that they'll reread every year mm -hmm. because as you grow and mature and whatever, yes, as that's an why I like to do it. You like take away something different, yep. right? And you'll probably see something in a different lens than you. And so I'm still yet to like do that myself, but. I would highly that's recommend doing it. That's what I did with uh, Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacs. And that's how I actually, I've always loved to read, but I kind of in college, like fell off reading. But my sophomore year, I started reading uh, Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacs. And I was like, oh my God, like this whole business work. take away from that? Oh God, that book is just insane. He, that book opened up my mind, just the context of where I was at. Like I was playing like business school, like I'm taking business courses, like I'm at the Iowa, like I don't really know what's out in the world. Yeah. And like reading that book just opened my mind, like the possibilities out there and like how like not how anyone can like achieve greatness. So, like you just need to like go chase it and like how you can build. And like, there's just like this whole tech world out there. Like that book changed my perspective on life and just like how I'm going to operate. And that like really fueled, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but that one really was like, I'm being an entrepreneur at some nice. point in my life. So yeah, that, that was my biggest takeaway from it. <laughs> what brought you to Austin? Um, so I li was living in Boston, uh, working at HubSpot there. I was there for a year. Um, Are they headquartered in Boston? Or? Yep, they're in uh, Cambridge, so okay. East Cambridge. Um, great office, but Boston was like, I love, it's a f amazing city, do not get me wrong, but it just was not the city for me. So I moved down to Austin about uh, 22 months ago now. So I've loved Austin. It's active, it's young, um, people here are incredible, like it's a tech scene, like people are creating here. So yeah, I absolutely love Austin, Texas. Nice. Who do you recommend move to Austin? What, like, if you had to... Give one reason someone should move here. What's your oh my gosh, uh, I'm probably like the biggest advocate for Austin, Texas that I know. Um, honestly, if you're young, if you're under 30, you don't have a family, you don't have an anchor. I think it just like makes sense to move to Austin, Texas. Like people, there are so many people moving here that are under 30, under 35, and they're like, oh, like I just moved here, like I want to make friends, like let's be friends types of things. And so it's been the, it's been so easy to make friends here just because of that reason. So if you're under 30, if you're interested in tech, interested in being outside, nice weather come down to Austin, Texas, good food as well. <laughs> nice. Cool. Um, I like, I like asking every guest some questions towards the end and we'll just go through these, but what's been your support system? What allows you to 
juggle multiple things. Yeah. Podcast. Um, my support system. I mean, my mom and like my parents are like my biggest support system. My mom from like a young age was always like, like leave Iowa, like go like spread your wings, go like do stuff. She will. It's just like that unconditional like love that like you only get from like a mom uh, where it's like, I will support you like no matter what you do. So, and like my stepdad and like my dad and like my sister, like they're all phenomenal as well. Like they will always support me in like what I do. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. Cause I'm mindful that like some people like didn't have that experience. So, um, I am incredibly grateful for like that support system that I have. And then of course, like my friends and stuff, like they're, I have some amazing friends here as well. And like, like some of my best friends are like some of my biggest supporters. So, nice. um, very grateful uh, for that. <laughs> nice. How do you run your company? What's your startup stack, tech stack? If you could walk us through. Oh, great question. Project management instantly. You mentioned some of the, yeah. just top to down. What What are the tools? Oh, for you phenomenal use? question. Yeah. So if we're doing email campaigns at like mass, we'll do instantly. Our CRM is HubSpot just because I work there. And we will always run through HubSpot. Um, we use Gmail. Um, trying to think like what else we use here. Monday.com is our project management. Um, we use better proposals to send our proposals okay. and that has been awesome. We were on DocuSign and then we moved to better proposals and you're like, you're able to see like p when people opened it, like okay. what they're looking at, like the projects, all that stuff, like they're able to sign directly on there, of course. Um, so that's how we send our proposals. We use Adobe for all of our, like our video editing and everything like that. Um, what are some other big ones? Yeah, those are kind of the big ones. Zyflow to send uh, actual like customer videos for like feedback. Okay. Yeah, we'll like send and they can like comment directly on there. So, What's it called? Uh, Zyflow. ZY or ZI? ZI. Okay. So okay. that's a uh, that's kind of our tech stack at a very high view. <laughs> nice. Pretty cool. What are three resources that you'd recommend to someone listening? These are all going to be books, probably. Number one, Steve Jobs, Walter Isaacson. Number two, uh, it's very it's very cliche. How to Win Friends and Influence People is honestly like a phenomenal book. I've read part of it. But. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I've read reread that book like three different times. A phenomenal book. And then the third one is The Confident Mind by Dr. Nate Zinser. He trained like uh, Eli Manning and a bunch of like Olympic athletes and he gives you very actionable aspects to like improve your confidence through like writing exercises, through like how to approach, situ how to frame situations. Um, so yeah, those are like the three books I would recommend uh, going to. Pretty cool. I do this thing towards the end where I'll ask you a last question from a previous guest and then I'll yeah. also ask you a question for whoever my next guest the is. Next guest, okay. So your question is, what tech are you most excited about that will take shape in 10 years? Oh, tech I'm most excited about in 10 years. You know, honestly, this the first one that comes to mind is Dolly, or not uh, Dolly, what's the, um, what's the, eight, what's their video generator one? I'm blanking on it so bad. Um, my journey, no. Not mid journey. Oh my gosh, what's, not Dolly. What's their, what's the video one that's coming out from ChatGPT? 4.0, no, I don't know. Oh my God, I'm blanking on it so bad. Anyways, whatever that one is, you might want to edit that part out. I no, cannot no, think not, of it. Hey, I'm, hey. I'm blanking on it so bad. Oh, um, it just came out. But that's like a video. Uh, Sora is probably what I'm most excited for. It's okay. People have been asking us about AI like so much. Like, how do you, how are you going to view AI? Like, why don't we just use AI? And I don't think AI tools, video tools are like there yet. Like they honestly don't look good at all. And like, you can tell when something's AI generated right now, it's like, this looks like crap. I think in 10 years though, Sora is going to be like insane. Um, it's could definitely be viewed as like a competitor to us, like a yeah. direct competitor, which is super fair. Like I'm mindful of that. Yeah. Um, but I think that technology is going to be super, super cool. So I'm kind of advocating for a competitor right there, but I think that technology will be super cool. It'll help our workflows. And like right now we're at the stage where like AI needs to be like a compliment. Um, for your, like, yeah, for what you're doing for like your processes and stuff. What's your question for a future guest? Um, let's do a failure that actually like pushed you forward. Okay. What's a failure that pushed you forward? Uh, one, one more thing I wanted to ask, and this is probably more selfish than anything else. <laughs> uh, how do you think about podcast post-production mm -hmm. and What's your process? What do you do? Content, yeah. clips? I mean, production, when it, how you market your podcast is how people are going to listen to it. So you need to be on like YouTube shorts. You need to be on TikTok. You need to be on LinkedIn. The more places you can consistently post like four or five X times a week, like the more you're going to be able to like grow your podcast. So from a straight content perspective, you need to be on all the platforms, definitely TikTok and like YouTube shorts or whatever reels, whatever they're all called. You need to be on those at like a minimum and posting like clips from your podcast. So uh, 
highly recommend to get an editor from like you i know you have an editing team so they can take care of that but yeah hire an editor to like actually like make it look really well done um and then just like post 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 that's what it all comes down to when it comes for, to podcasting it's like how many times can you post a week on like those platforms and like actually reach your audience so that's how i think about it i made a tiktok account yeah and i just posted two videos yeah and i got permanently banned what i don't even know why they don't no. even tell me why Oh my god! And so I lost the tag funds and founders, so I'll do something else. But they won't even tell me why it's banned. No way! Um, and I just posted two reels from the first episode that I had posted on YouTube as well. Oh, that breaks my heart. Like, yeah. Um, Wait, can you sign up with just a new username? No. Yeah, I will. Okay, I will yeah, I'll I do just say, a new yeah. username. But I lost the funds, funds and founders. founders. Yeah, yeah you could do um, funds and founders pod or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, that's such a bummer though. And I'm like, why? They're like, you violated guidelines. I'm like, tell me which ones. Yeah, I posted we, one. Point video. to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I know. Um, I, I was looking on Reddit. They're super opaque with that process. So. Mm. I'm like that's fine. It is what it is. So. Yeah, I know if you're using like video, uh, like audio and stuff, you have to make sure it's not like copyrighted and all that stuff. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you had. But audio they flag on. it. They still flag it. Why would they permanently, permanently ban? Ban? Yeah, that's insane. Um, but no, I was thinking about we're just doing everything else right now: like Instagram, YouTube, and yeah, yeah. Starting LinkedIn. Did you know LinkedIn is doing a video feed? Oh really? No, I did not know that. So That'll be big time a- though. They've been A/B testing it, and um, some people have like a video for you feed. But mm-hmm. if you just open any video on LinkedIn, um, you can. It's it's sort of like a TikTok scroll motion. Um, oh, interesting. So LinkedIn is a platform that could be 10x better than what it is. <laughs> so, like, if you go to any, um, but if you go to any video, it becomes oh, that's insane. Scene. Oh my gosh. And um, so I'm gonna start. Um, yeah, that's a move. I did not know that. That looks really good. Yeah. yeah. And there's no way to directly access it right now, but like you could scroll. Some folks are getting hundreds of thousands of impressions. Oh on my their gosh! Videos with zero to no followers, like oh, that's insane. So oh yeah, you want to hop on that trend early? Yeah, and so I'm I'm like I have 23 episodes, roughly five reels an episode. Oh, publish all of it. Yeah, like publish just, literally all of it. Yeah. <laughs> just, now I think one reason why um, I feel like analysis paralysis gets to me is. I'm thinking about, okay, what's the right time to post on Reels? What's the right time to schedule a post? Yeah, yeah. To do 12 p.m., 7 p.m. And then yeah, there's all uh, these, yeah. like, YouTube settings with, like, do it to your own audience, not do it. I'm like, I don't think I'm there yet. Yeah, I yeah. I not worry about that. <laughs> but in my mind, I want to do it perfectly just because I know there's things I could do to make it better. Yeah. Oh, but I think what's more important is just getting the stuff out there and then. Yeah, there goes, there's so much that goes into optimizing, like, YouTube shorts and everything. It's insane. Like, even like the, your file name needs to be like SEO, like friendly and stuff. Like you can't just oh, really? like, yeah, yeah I, I, yeah, I found that out like two months ago. So yeah, even like your file name, you can't just be like Ryan upload it has to be like SEO terms in there and stuff, which also helps with it. So yeah, it's, it's Seriously? insane. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll see Have you I can seen find a difference article. or no? You know, I have actually seen a difference. Uh, the ones that we actually like do like SEO are, do perform better overall. I don't know if it's like a huge difference. Maybe it's just like a bunch of other variables that go into it, but at all times, I try and get like my file name lined up with like our title and stuff like that. I'll see if I can send you the article. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just thinking, is this why none of my reels are performing? Yeah, I don't know. It, it's tough. Uh, There's a lot out there. <laughs> too much. I feel like at what point does it matter? Because like, yeah, Google's SEO thing came out, and apparently I they were that. ranking stuff that people thought weren't important. And so I'm like, at what point are you trying to game the system? Yeah. Versus on the other side, people say if it's good content, it will get visibility anyway. But I don't know. I'm just, it's too much. I, I got, it, it is too much. Let me focus on the interview. I don't want to focus on. That's why I like clicks. only doing the interviews. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want the clicks in the, cl- I can make clickbaity titles. Yeah. Yeah. I can ask you clickbaity questions, but I don't enjoy that. But. Yeah. I, the interviewing a podcast is by far the best part. <laughs> Wait, um, no, but this was really good conversation. Thank you for coming on. Where can folks find you? What do you want to plug? What can we link for you in the description? Yeah, uh, you guys can just check us out at www.spacebarvisuals.com. And then uh, you can uh, guys can just find me on LinkedIn at Ryan Atkinson, CEO of Space Bar Visuals. I'll be there. Okay, sweet. We'll link everything. <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> but no, but thank you for coming on. I yeah, really thank you so much. Appreciate I appreciate it. it. Yeah, thank yeah. you.